Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second discussion of our community conversation series. This is where we are dealing with racism and reforms, which is being hosted by the town of Arlington and co-sponsored by the Arlington Human Rights Commission. Uh, the Visions Incorporated, the APD assessment presentation has been moved, by the way, just so you know, to Monday, July 27th at 7 p.m. Tonight's panel discussion will be centered around housing and racism. Uh, we are going to be going over some ground rules in just a minute and expectations for tonight. And then we're going to hear from our panelists and go into some questions and answer session at the end of that. Uh, first, I want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Crystal Haynes. I, I'm a reporter, an anchor reporter at Boston 25 News. Um, there I have a housing series called Priced Out, which has been nominated for a few Emmys, which I'm proud to say. Um, so these conversations are so important to especially the folks in the Commonwealth and right here in Arlington. And as a community member here in Arlington, I was excited to be able to moderate today's panel as well. Just to give you a little bit more of an introduction of the folks that you're seeing on your screen, Leon Andrews Jr. Uh, was appointed the inaugural director of the Race, Equity and Leadership Reel at the National League of Cities and currently serves as the chair of the board for the National Recreation and Parks Association. Um, Manisha, Manisha uh, Butra uh, is an AICP, AICP is certified uh, as a city planner and works as a senior associate at Beacon Leadership Collaborative as well as a sole proprietor offering workshop facilitation and public process consultation. And Catherine Levine Einstein is an associate professor of political science at Boston University and a faculty fellow at Boston University's Initiative on Cities. She's also one of the authors of a uh, of the book a Neighborhood Defenders: Participatory Politics and America's Housing Crisis. And welcome to you all today. Thank you so much for joining us for this really important conversation we're having here in community. So first, I want to go over some ground rules because we are obviously meet, meeting uh, virtual tonight and we have so much to go through. So we want to make sure that we address all of your questions and uh, facilitate being able to continue these conversations. This session will be recorded and is being live streamed and will be available through ACMI as well. Now, the chat box has been turned off but you can submit your questions and answers and that will all be documented. Here are some ground rules here. We have the responsibility to respect and build on the strength that diversity provides. We will engage in polite and constructive and or productive dialogue and feedback. We will respectfully disagree with each other. These are difficult subjects and we understand that. Unless you are a designated representative of an organization, opinions are considered your own. When sharing a question, please be short and to the point. We do have a limited time frame here. We want to respect everyone's time. And we want to use this moment in space to take some time to allow for self-reflection. Take deep breaths throughout this. Make sure you are sinking in to all of these uh, the information that's being presented to you as today. And as we begin, I want to provide a moment of self-reflection for uh, everyone to consider these questions as you are listening to our panelists today, all right? When did I or my family move to Arlington and what brought me or us here? What do I know about the neighborhoods of Arlington and the surrounding communities? What are their physical characteristics? Do neighborhoods vary with regards to income, racial makeup, or with regards to other social and economic characteristics? Are there stereotypes or realities about these different places. So keep all those things in mind as we move you through a lot of really important information. And please, again, you can, in, the chat box has been disabled, but you can put questions up in the Q&A there. So first up, we want to uh, move into our discussion piece and speak with uh, Leon Andrews. And Leon is gonna be talking about the role of the National League of Cities and corresponding work in Arlington and the region. Thank you, Crystal. I uh, will share my screen. Can everyone see that? Great, thumbs up if you can hear me. Good, great. Um, so it's great to be with everyone uh, today and, um, and looking forward to the discussion that we have. I, I wanted to really frame this from 
um, from a national level and maybe name some things that I think hopefully will tee up a more localized discussion. Um, I think we all have been seeing uh, the rising uh, tension, the protests and the uprisings that have happened in the last month with George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Amon Aubrey, and so many others. Um, and this is obviously not the first time we've been here as a country. Um, and uh, But what we are seeing is that in the last month, over a thousand cities, towns, and villages have really been seeing the protests, uh, uprisings, um, that are happening. And this is all sizes and in every part of our country. Um, I thought this quote from the, the late Dr. Maya Angelou, I thought really spoke to the moment, uh, really do I think it's important as we talk about the importance of these conversations. Her quote, prejudice is a burden that confuses the past. It threatens the future and renders the present inaccessible. For me, really spoke to this moment. Um, for me, it says our inability to be able to have these conversations, to be explicit about the kinds of conversations we need to have as a community, uh, to be willing to lean into the uncomfortable. Um, uh, we'll only find ourselves coming back to this issue uh, a year from now, five years from now, 15 years from now, 50 years from now. And I think that's the work. The work is not where I think we were five years ago, which is so many cities and towns were saying, well, we didn't want to be a Ferguson. I mean, everyone remembered where we were when we saw Ferguson. Um, and a lot of cities were not, and city leaders were not necessarily ready to respond. And so the response we were hearing from city leaders was help us avoid that from happening. I think that's a very different conversation what we're hearing from leadership now and city leaders across this country. It's not about preventing further conflict. It really is what do we need to do to address the systemic inequities, uh, the issues of racism, systemic and structural. Um, and I think that from that perspective, um, our work real, which has been around now for the last five years, is really well positioned to support city leaders that are in this space. Our mission, our goal is to strengthen local leaders' knowledge and capacity to eliminate racial disparities, to heal racial tensions, and to build more equitable communities. And in that space, we offer a number of things for city leaders, trainings, uh, capacity building, technical assistance, network building with other city leaders across this country, and also the recognition that this work um, is not isolated to one population. When we talk about issues of racial equity, how it intersects with issues of LGBTQ, women and girls, boys, boys and men of color, um, our religiously persecuted population, our indigenous community, re realizing there's so many intersections in this work, and that's gonna be so important as we have these conversations of understanding the nuances and the complexities that are connected to that. And so in the last five years, uh, we have been in uh, over 400 cities, towns, and villages across this country. Um, we recognize that it's not, this issue is not just happening in one segment of our country, it's happening across the country. We, uh, we are, um, it's our pleasure to be working with the town of Arlington as they are, have been on this journey uh, for the last several months and last year or so. Um, and so that has been a part of our work. I um, also want to acknowledge our partners in this space, want to give them a shout out. They've been good partners with us, our Government Alliance for Race and Equity, GARE, um, a really good partner. We, NLC has had a formal partnership with them. A lot of the content that we have shaped um, has been not to reinvent the wheel and learn from good partners like GARE and so many others that are out there. And the reason why I bring that up is because of the framework that we use. The framework we use is very much tied to our partners at GARE. Um, this, the need to create spaces like we're having today to normalize a conversation on racial, on racial equity, on terminology that we use. What do we mean when we say certain things? And how do we create the space to normalize? It's really critical, um, a lot of work we do in that space. Um, and then once we do some of the normalizing work, and just to acknowledge, normalizing is ongoing. You never reach to a point where you have fully normalized, right? It's a commitment to ongoing normalizing as a city, as a town. But then you also want to equip yourself with tools, operationalizing it, looking at data, um, looking at how we are looking at disaggregation of data and its impact in your in your town. Um, and then what's the organizing that needs to happen? What's the infrastructure that needs to be built? What's the partnerships that need to be in place? And, and a lot of what you're seeing today, and I think that's also tied to the larger commitment of Arlington, is really trying to implement all three of these components. And while my job today is not to go through all three, I, I do want to make sure we're naming the things that I think are important in our normalizing for our conversation today at a larger level. 
Uh, the first, just to be very clear, why we lead with race. Uh, we lead with race because the data takes us there. When we talk about um, uh, the data from infant mortality to life expectancy, race is still the strongest predictor of one's success in this country. And so that's whether we're talking about education or housing or health or environment, um, race is still the strongest predictor, right? And the data takes us there. And this is just an example of a data point. This was a study that was done by the Center for Disease Control looking at maternal mortality rates of women across the country. It isolated for the woman's background, how much money she made, her education, where she, where she, um, where she lived in uh, regionally, um, and what they found is that black women were still two to three times higher uh, to have higher rates of maternal mortality. And so there, the question is, if race is predicting that, why? Why is that? It's not just naming the disparity, but getting to the why, to the root cause, which is why it's important to understand the data and then be able to ask the questions, the root, root cause questions. Um, and this to also be very clear that we're not just talking about maternal mortality rates. We're talking about how we understand race being the strongest predictor as we look at a range of in indicators from our education, criminal justice, unemployment, and yes, even our housing and housing costs. And I wanted to name that because we're leading with race and understanding why we lead with race is so important. And so then just from a normalizing standpoint, if we know race is still the strongest predictor of one's success, if you're hearing the term racial equity, racial equity is closing the gaps so race doesn't predict one's success while improving outcomes for everyone. And so that's the goal of why we are centering racial equity. And so if we know that race is predicting one's success, what do we need to do to be targeted in our, in our efforts? A term referred to as targeted universalism by Dr. John Powell, targeted in our process, but universal in our goals. And so to be able to do that, we have to go beyond services. We got to get to the root causes. We have to be able to understand the systemic inequities, uh, which is absolutely critical. And so I named all of that, but I can't also um, not make sure I'm naming, if we're going to have this conversation, talking about racism. And so to be able to talk about racism is to understand racism as a system, that it's interconnected among individual racism, institutional racism, and structural racism. And really importantly in this conversation to understand not just how they're connected, but to know from a policy standpoint, which is what this conversation will be about, that there were policies, practices, procedures that have benefited white people over communities of color, many times intentionally and sometimes unintentionally, right? And it, it didn't just happen in one institution, it has happened in multiple institutions. And so the multiple institutions is what structural racism is. And so if you're hearing the terminology, I just want to make sure we're naming the difference between institutional racism is acknowledging it's happened in one institution. Structural racism is acknowledging it's happened in multiple institutions. And systemic racism is acknowledging that this uh, racism exists across multiple levels. And so I know I said a whole lot, and I, I thought it was really important to name that, but I also want to make sure I bring it in in a way that I hope is compelling enough. And so I have this uh, very short video I want to be able to play from a longer documentary called The House We Live In. I hope it names it and hopefully compels the framing of the conversation. So I'm going to cue that up and hopefully allow that to help us frame. Hundreds of thousands of GIs came home ready to start families, but had no place to live. In the 1930s, the federal government created the Federal Housing Administration, whose job it was to uh, provide loans or the backing for loans to average Americans so they could purchase a home. Federal programs and banks sank millions into the home construction industry. Their message to veterans, you can afford a new home, buy a new home now. Tax dollars help make the single family home a mass produced consumer item. The American dream had a new name, suburbia. came to Levittown and we 
found the model house and we walked in and we looked around and uh, of course in the eyes of a uh, young man who was raised in the ghetto so to speak it was an interesting experience interesting lifestyle seeing all the new modern conveniences very fascinating Eugene Burnett came home with almost a million other black GIs. They had fought for the country in segregated ranks. They returned hoping for equality and the American dream. For many, that dream was a new home for little money down and some of the easiest credit terms in history. I went up to the salesman, we're interested in your home, we're interested in buying one, and uh, what is the procedure? Is there an application to be filled out? So forth. So he looked at me, looked around, and he said to me, he says, listen, it's not me, but the owners of this development have not as yet decided to sell these homes to Negroes. The FHA underwriters warned that the presence of even one or two non-white families could undermine real estate values in the new suburbs. These government guidelines were widely adopted by private industry. Race had long played a role in local real estate practices. Starting in the 1930s, Government officials institutionalized the national appraisal system, where race was as much a factor in real estate assessment as the condition of the property. Using this scheme, federal investigators evaluated 239 cities across the country for financial risk. So that those communities that were all white, suburban, and far away from minority areas uh, they received the highest rating, and that was the color green. Those communities that were all minority or in the process of changing, they got the lowest rating and the color red. They were redlined. As a consequence, most of the mortgages went to suburbanizing America, and it suburbanized it racially. As homes in white communities appreciated in value, the net worth of these white families grew. For most non-white families who stayed in urban neighborhoods, the housing market open to them in the 50s and 60s was largely a rental market. You don't gain equity by paying rent. Where one's family lives in America is not just a matter of, of taste and preference. You have the issue of housing and wealth. The majority of Americans hold most of their wealth in the form of home equity. So that's their nest egg. That's how they can finance the education of their offspring. That's how they can um, sort of save up for retirement. Um, it's their savings bank, right? They're living in their savings bank. My family, like a lot of families, was in Detroit struggling to buy a house. You had a dual housing market, one white, one black. A housing market with one with a lot of demand, another housing market with very little demand. My father lives in the house that I grew up in. The house today, five bedroom house, is worth about $20,000. The same house bought in the suburbs would be worth today about $320,000. So whites moving to the suburbs were being subsidized in the accumulation of wealth, while blacks were being divested. And these were public policy decisions in which, on one hand, people were given access to property, um, given title, and subsequently wealth. And on another hand, where people were not given access to property, did not generate wealth, and did not generate the kind of opportunity for the next generation. So I, I hope that the, that short video gives you a little bit of more framing on some of the terminology and some of the history. Um, and as we delve into this conversation to know that 
um, while that broader framing acknowledges our history, that history has impacted our present. Uh, I encourage you to watch the full video. Again, it's called The House We Live In by a three-part series, Race to Power of Illusion. Um, but I'm looking forward to us going a little bit deeper and really understanding the implications of redlining, not just redlining, but a number of other issues that really play out as we look at um, our own history here in Arlington. So I leave you with this quote. I hope you lean into this as we have our conversation that we're no longer accepting the things I can't, we cannot change. We're changing the things we cannot accept. Thanks. Very well said. Thank you so much, uh, Leon, for that. And I think that that was a great way to sort of tee up this conversation by with that video and, and the voices that we heard there. And we, we hope to continue this conversation in Arlington to do a deeper dive into the issues about housing policy and land use and, of course, redlining like we just heard from that video that Leon was uh, speaking about. We're going to uh, invite into the conversation uh, Catherine Levine Einstein. Thank you so much. And thank you, Leon, for that really, those really helpful framing remarks. Um, they said really nicely, um, was sort of where I wanted to begin um, my conversation here. Um, and so um, first, I just want to make sure, can everyone see my, my screen? I just shared it. Thumbs up if people can see it. Awesome. Okay. Um, so I first actually want to introduce myself to folks. Um, in addition to being a faculty member at Boston University um, and studying this policy area, I'm also a resident of Arlington, live in the Heights. Um, and so if you ever run into me, um, I'm happy to talk about these issues um, further. If you have questions or things that you know you, you want to push against a little, I, I always love to talk about land use and racism, housing policy, and zoning. So Leon, um, I think, did a really nice job of laying out what redlining is. And so I wanted to begin by just giving everyone a bit of a framework for what redlining looked like in, um, in the Boston area and in greater Boston. Um, and so um, this is just a map that shows us. Um, Katie, very, Katie yes, sorry to interrupt. Um, we see the Google Doc instead of your slide. Oh, shoot. I am sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let me go back to the share screen and get the right one. Um, all right, there we go. Map now, beautiful. <laughs> so this is the um, the map of redlining and sort of the importance um, of thinking regionally, right? So what I hope that folks um, can take away from looking at this map here is in really thinking about um, sort of how, how do one think about um, sort of how different parts of the region and their decisions um, really sort of affect one another. And two, um, how much of the way that Arlington and metropolitan Boston, what they look like today, um, how much this is very much shaped um, by um, decision, deliberate government decision making, right? And so here you can see um, sort of the circled part in Arlington, there are no redlined areas in Arlington. There was no part of Arlington that was declared sort of off limits for federally backed mortgages during this time period. Um, in contrast, right, we start to look at other areas of the Boston metro region and there, there were a lot of parts that were redlined. And also for those who sort of think about um, how that matches up with demographics today, those are disproportionately homes to black and Latinx residents. And so again, those decisions that were made um, back in the 1930s have really important impacts today. Um, and Arlington sort of doesn't exist just as an island in this way. And so where I wanna move is thinking about both redlining, but really linking it with a lot of other important government decision-making. Um, so redlining is this really important set of public policies that was done by the federal government and private banks, but it was done in concert with a lot of other really important government decisions. Um, and so one of those important government decisions is, again, at the federal level, these federally backed mortgage insurance policies that were done by the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration through loans. Um, there are also racial covenants, and I know that Manisha is going to talk about some of those issues in her presentation um, and how it applies to Arlington. And that's something that's done both by homeowners associations and at the local level. There's also zoning and land use regulations that are done at the local level. Um, and all of these policies have really helped to reinforce each other. Um, I'm gonna spend a bit of the rest of the time today that I have talking with you guys about zoning and land use. 
because that is the policy lever over which local governments have most directly control. Um, and since this is a local government forum, um, I thought it would be a really productive place to focus our energies is thinking about how this policy institution over which local governments have direct control may shape the way that our neighborhoods look, both in very sort of deliberate ways and ways that may be a bit more subtle. So over the last few years, there's been two just killer books that have come out, one The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein and the other Segregation by Design by Jessica Traunstein that do an absolutely incredible job through a mix of archival research um, and statistical evidence to show us that zoning and land use regulations were very much created in the United States to segregate our communities by race and by class. The fact that places with more land use regulations are also more racially segregated, this is not an accident. This is very much a decision that was made back in the first part of the 1900s through present day um, to deliberately segregate our communities. And one really important takeaway from this research is that regulations don't have to mention race to have racially disparate impact. Right. Um, so historically, there were some very explicit racial zoning ordinances that prevented black people from living in certain neighborhoods. And those obviously had a profound effect on their communities. But these regulations could also be more subtle. They could be things like single family zoning, saying that a neighborhood could only have single family homes. It turns out that that has a really similar effect in terms of producing racial and class based segregation. Um, we also have this incredibly robust finding across a huge number of studies in housing policy and economics research that shows us that places that have more land use regulations have higher housing costs and higher levels of racial and class-based segregation. Again, this is like one of the most consistent and powerful findings in housing policy research um, that replicates across a huge number of studies. Um, and it turns out that if you restrict multifamily housing by say only allowing single family houses, it both makes the housing more expensive in those communities. And it also segregates white people from black and Latinx people. Um, importantly, we've also found in research that land use regulations make it harder for important federal government affordable housing programs like public housing and low income housing tax credits to operate effectively. So these local regulations both have a direct effect on the housing supply and also shape the federal government's ability if it is so inclined to provide infusions for affordable housing. So what we do at the local level on zoning is so, so important. Um, I really want to flag, because this is a common misconception that I hear from folks about zoning, that just because you have an inclusionary zoning ordinance, this does not mean that your zoning is inclusive and that your land use is inclusive. You can have an inclusionary zoning ordinance and still be an exclusionary community. Um, one of the best local examples of this, which comes from phenomenal research um, by uh, a local resident named Amy Dane, is Dover, Massachusetts, whose inclusionary zoning ordinance requires all new developments above a certain size to make 25% of their units affordable, which sounds amazing. As someone who supports affordable housing deeply, that sounds on its face wonderful. Um, there have been no new units of affordable housing produced under that inclusionary zoning ordinance because it in practice makes it so hard to build in the community that nothing gets built. So I just wanna flag that just because there are certain language used in zoning ordinances that seem inclusive, it does not mean that the land use policy itself in a community is inclusive. So one of the things that I um, really was deeply interested in um, after reading these incredibly important works about um, racism and land use regulations were some of the more subtle ways that racism might manifest in land use. And so along with some um, BU uh, colleagues, Max Palmer and David Glick, um, I, we really wanted to dig deeper to understand how land use affects local politics and creates profound political inequalities in our local landscape. And so one of the really important features about land use regulations in the United States is that they create opportunities for neighborhood participants to stop or delay the construction of new housing, both big units, um, big projects and small projects, and that this political power contributes to exploding, exploding housing costs in the United States and also empowers a really unrepresentative group of older white homeowners to essentially control their neighborhoods. Um, and so just to give folks who may not have been involved in land use politics like a brief primer about how this works, 
is that because of the way that land use is set up in the United States, neighbors and abutters are officially invited to participate in the housing development process when the housing is essentially bigger than a certain um, sort of by right size. Um, and what this does is it empowers neighborhood associations and neighborhood councils, as well as property owners. Um, and incidentally, this is not just a story that's limited to housing, which, though that is our sort of focus here. And this is very much by design in urban planning, that these land use regulations were designed to really empower these neighborhood voices. Um, but the question is, is, is this actually sort of good for neighborhood democracy, or is this actually empowering the most privileged voices, the whitest voices in the community to control what happens? And so my colleagues and I wanted to dig deep to understand who participates in these neighborhood forums. Um, and so to do this, we did a deep dive into land use politics in Massachusetts, including in Arlington over a three year period. So we looked at every single planning and zoning board meeting minute, um, and there are thousands of pages of them in 97 cities and towns in Massachusetts. Um, and we collected data on every single meeting that involved the construction of more than one housing, which includes everything from infill development, like accessory apartments, to really big apartment complexes. Um, and the meeting minutes um, from these cities and towns, we, we learned the names, addresses, and the positions on proposed housing developments of folks who spoke out at these forums. Um, and we also, in some cases, learned the reasons that people gave for opposing or supporting a project. So we learned a lot about 3,300 commenters who made 4,200 comments across a bunch of Massachusetts cities and towns over this period. And so from these meeting minutes, just reading these meeting minutes, we can learn the positions taken um, and the reasons that folks gave for those positions. But we can also learn a ton about the demographics of these individuals because we have their addresses. And so we were actually able to merge this information with the Massachusetts voter file and some property records to learn whether or not these folks owned homes, well, how old they were, what their partisan identification was, how long they've lived somewhere, their vote history. And we could use their race using a name matching algorithm that I'm happy to chat more about if people are interested. And so the big punchline that we found is that these neighborhood meetings are producing profound political inequality. The people who show up to speak about housing developments are deeply unrepresentative of their broader communities, and they're much more privileged than their broader communities. So they're dramatically more likely to be homeless. They're much more likely to be over the age of 50. Um, they're also eight percentage points more likely to be white. Um, and Latinx people in particular were se just severely underrepresented at these forums. They are 8% of voters in these 97 cities and towns and only 1% of commenters in these cities and towns. Um, and men were also somewhat overrepresented in these forums. The people who show up to these meetings are also overwhelmingly opposed to the construction of new housing. So only 14% of people show up to these, um, these meetings to support a project. And this is true for projects that are overwhelmingly affordable, in some cases exclusively affordable housing projects. This is also true for projects that are big. It's true for projects that are small. People do not show up to these hearings and it sort of espouse these pro-housing positions. And so these forums that were on their faces, these tools to empower neighborhoods, have in practice become these instead tools for privileged white homeowners to block new housing opportunities from being built in their communities. And so one of the big takeaways from our research we found is that both advantaged people and advantaged communities are more likely to show up in opposition to the construction of all types of new housing. And so again, thinking back to that map I showed you guys at the beginning of this presentation of metropolitan Boston, what that means is in privileged communities like Arlington, there are going to be way more people showing up to oppose housing than in more disadvantaged communities. Um, and so this, what it means is advantaged communities are disproportionately protected from development. But that doesn't mean development doesn't happen just because people in Arlington or Winchester and Belmont fight development. It doesn't mean that it magically goes away. Instead, what we find is it gets really heavily concentrated in Black and Latinx communities in the city of Boston, which have just borne the brunt of the greater Boston development pressures. And so when we when we fight development, right, again, just it doesn't go away. The effects of development are really unevenly felt across metropolitan Boston. 
And so again, just to really hit this home, wealthy areas are better able to organize and to oppose housing. And developers, they know this, they actually avoid some areas where they expect high opposition or propose much more scaled back projects. And so gentrifying areas bear the brunt of development pressures, um, which makes it really hard to build good coalitions around market rate and affordable housing. It makes housing politics really challenging. Um, and so just to quickly conclude, um, what I want to emphasize here is I think land use reform is incredibly important. I think this is a critical part of combating racism and segregation in housing. But you notice, right, I put the part in red. It is a part of addressing the housing crisis. And I don't think there's anyone out there that thinks that zoning alone is going to solve the housing crisis. But it is a necessary first step because if we do not make it possible to build multifamily housing and affordable housing um, easily and cheaply, it will not happen. Um, if people are interested in this data for progress has put out a report called Homes for All, which lays out this point really well, that local governments can control the land use. And that if we want to get more funding for affordable housing, we also need to simultaneously be lobbying our federal and state governments to be really supporting affordable housing, to be supporting renters um, in a variety of ways. Um, so I wanna thank everyone for joining this forum. It's so exciting to see so many people participating. Um, and again, I just wanted to flag that this is collaborative research um, with my colleagues at Boston University who I'm really grateful helped with this work. So thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. That was a tremendous work and, and a lot of information. Again, we're going to be posting this entire presentation up online so that if you all need to go back, if you need to skip it, skip forward and backwards to really digest this information, we're going to have that available to you. Uh, up next, I want to talk about what this means for us here at home, right here in Arlington. And Manisha Butra, she's going to be answering some of those questions. Great, um, I can try to start, start my video again. Um, I don't, I have a message, got it. One moment. You'll see my um, my PowerPoint screen now. Great. Um, so good evening, everyone. I'm Manisha Butra. I am a professional city planner. I also live in Melrose, where I've served in elected office as well as um, previously on our Human Rights Commission. Um, Melrose and Arlington have a, share a lot of similarities. We're both streetcar suburbs meaning that um, we were developed around the turn of the century in the early, early 20th century. Um, we are both uh, communities along the end of the, um, in Arlington's case, the MBTA red line and in Melrose's case, the orange line. Um, so when I was doing kind of a, a deep dive into some of um, what I see in Arlington, I saw a lot of similarities to what I've uh, seen here at home. And I really appreciate um, you all for uh, letting me kind of dive into what's happening in Arlington. Um, so to kind of loop back to some of the questions um, at the beginning of our presentations tonight, uh, so, hey, Manisha, sorry, can you just um, make your PowerPoint full screen? Okay, so it's showing me a different, thank you. What's, I couldn't tell which screen it was. Um, what, it's doing this funny. One second, guys, sorry, technical difficulties. It's showing the wrong, oh, you know what? I'm going to stop share and see if it gives me. Sorry, there we go. Now it's hopefully, is that the full screen version now? Yes, I'll pass, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, the questions we wanted to start with are, you know, things just to think about. Um, I think Leon and, um, and Katie gave some really great overviews of things that, you know, happened around the country as well as thinking about things here in Arlington. And I wanna, um, you know, as we think about race and housing, there's sort of the data and the maps and the patterns and the persistent uh, aspects of uh, residential segregation. And then there's also what does it mean to be part of a community? So um, thinking about 
you know, when did you or your family move here and what brought you here? Uh, what do you know of the neighborhoods of this community and surrounding communities? Think about sort of developing like a mental map of the different neighborhoods, things maybe you've heard, whether it's the physical characteristics, single family homes, um, higher rise apartment buildings, um, features like water and roadways, um, things like that. Um, but also how do the neighborhoods vary with regards to income, racial makeup, or with regards to other social and economic characteristics? Um, are there stereotypes you hear about whether it's Arlington or about the surrounding communities and, and how do those match up with, with your experience or the realities uh, you face? And then thinking further, how, um, you know, as I show some demographic data and some maps, how does what you know match up with the data? Um, and does, does just looking at some data and some maps uh, change your perspective? How did this community come to be? Um, this Arlington, before it was Arlington, was initially um, a place where the Massachusetts tribe lived. Um, roadways like Mass Ave were roadways that date back to pre-colonial times and water bodies uh, like Spy Pond uh, date back to those times as well. Um, do we think about what happened before colonization? Um, European settlers arrived around 1635 and there are homes uh, along, our, along Massachusetts Avenue and and other older parts of the city that date back to the American Revolution. Um, you may share the pride of being part of um, those initial battles of the American Revolution when um, Paul Revere did his midnight ride as well as William Dawes. One of the things I was thinking about in preparing for this are how even back in the 1700s, Arlington was part of a region. William Dawes came from what is um, from Roxbury to start his ride and Paul Revere came up through Medford um, starting in the North End. And, um, and then later, you know, again, I mentioned the streetcars um, expansion out from Boston and Cambridge, uh, the extension of the MBTA red line into Arlington. And as we think about our community, thinking about what is the relationship Arlington has to the surrounding region? So Arlington um, has been experiencing a lot of recent growth, um, both in terms of uh, school enrollment, um, but also, you know, if you look at uh, the chart on the upper right shows school enrollment, and then the lower right is um, the year most people each um, the year people moved into their current home. Uh, so as you can see on this chart, um, more than three quarters of the, or around three quarters of the population moved into Arlington, into their current place of residence um, since the 2000s. So there's a lot of, um, there's been a lot of movement, but really this, the, the town uh, Hi, Benicia. I think I think your slide uh, is is not advancing. I think I'm sorry. I'm looking at the wrong screens, and uh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Here's our slides. Um, sorry about that. Thank you for interrupting me. So the top right shows how school enrollment's grown since the early '90s, um, but I like to show kind of these historical look because it shows that um, that that. Although school enrollment has grown recently, um, it dipped in the early 90s. And uh, a lot of movement has happened in the community. Everything okay now? Just heard another. Yeah, yeah, we, we're not, see I don't know if you're sharing the right screen because we're not seeing any slides at all, just you. Oh gosh, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. Great information though. Um, so when I finally get to back to the slide, what you'll see is, okay, do you see full screen? Yes, we do, do. we have them, yes. Okay, um, I have no idea how I stopped that, but you know, last <laughs> uh, Zoom webinar. So, um, so the two charts show that there's been a lot of recent movement 
But the chart on the left is um, shows that the town's population actually peaked in 1970 and then dipped. So a lot of times when people talk about the population growth and change that's happened, we're looking at a shorter time frame, um, more recent history. And it's important to keep in mind that um, the population has changed significantly, um, increased and decreased over time. Arlington's median household incomes around $170,000. Uh, um, median value of owner occupied homes, the homeowners, uh, median house price is um, $609,800. And um, the mix between owners and renters is about 60% of households are owner occupied and 40% are renter occupied. And the chart on the right shows um, the income level of renter households by income and owner households by income. As you can see, uh, owners typically have a higher income level. Uh, so these are some charts off of the town website regarding um, the income level, the maximum income limit that um, folks can have in order to be eligible for affordable housing. I included this because a lot of times when we talk about affordable housing, it's not always clear what thresholds we're talking about. Um, so the average household size for um, for the region, I, this is not Arlington specific, but the region is around 2.5 people. Um, so, you know, small families. Um, and the regional metro region median household incomes around 88,000 uh, or close to $89,000 per household and close to 80,000 for the state as a whole. Um, if you look at the numbers for a family of four, you kind of get a con context um, for rental housing through the Housing Corporation of Arlington, income level would be about $71,000 or about $96,000 for first time home buyers and other rental housing. Oops, <laughs> keep forgetting it doesn't switch on both screens. So um, now to talk about a little bit about race and other types of diversity, including ethnicity, foreign, bon foreign population, and language spoken at home. Um, this chart on the right is Arlington in comparison with your neighbors, um, as well as Boston. Um, what you can see is that um, the sort of teal color is a non-Hispanic white population. Arlington is one of is the second to least diverse of of your neighbors. Um, you've got about 20% foreign born population and um, about 22% speak a language other than English at home. So in terms of thinking about being welcoming and uh, inclusive, how are we thinking about language um, about ways to support um, people of other races and ethnicities who are non-white. And then um, diving into zoning and land use policy. Um, so Katie talked a little bit about um, sort of the challenge with building housing and with uh, single family zoning. The light yellow on the zoning map is single family residential uh, zoning. The sort of medium darker yellow is two families. And you can see those are the two housing types that, that are dominant in Arlington. And the chart on the left um, shows Arlington again in comparison with neighbors. There is a little more housing diversity than some of the other suburban communities, um, but, uh, but when it comes, but most are for one and two families. Uh, I also included this map of CDBG community development block grant eligible block groups, um, partially because I think what really jumped out to me is is the the um, land use pattern that you see of where the low and moderate income um, census tracts and block groups are. So this is a little bit of um, repeat from what Katie presented earlier. Um, this is uh, the map, or the maps of the region from the 1938 
residential security maps, which we often refer to as the redlining maps. Um, we incl I included the whole region just to, so you can get a sense of um, uh, where Arlington is in context and where some of those so-called redlined areas are, um, which you'll see in Boston, in Cambridge, in Malden, and some of the other communities. Um, so this, this uh, is a close-up of the Arlington map. And I just pulled out um, this website, uh, which is, um, what is it called? Um, Mapping Inequality, I believe is what it's called. Um, and I have the link on the slide. Uh, it does some really great, it pulls out some, some of the particularly shocking things that um, are shown in the notes for these maps. So I just included some of the ones that they highlighted for Boston, Cambridge, Arlington. Um, you can see if you're reading the screen, and I'm hesitant to read them because they're pretty uh, offensive in some cases, but basically um, discriminating against folks by religion, um, meaning uh, Jewish buyers, discriminating against um, Asian folks, which are called Oriental uh, in this, in this, um, on these maps, uh, uh, black and African American folks and um, and foreigners, and they use terms such as infiltration. And now the three maps they showed uh, put together. You've got um, the zoning map, the present day zoning map, the um, the redlining map, and the CDBG block grant map. Again, the green was the sort of highest value neighborhoods. Blue was um, sort of still good. Uh, and the yellow was um, considered declining um, with infiltration. So Arlington does have a mix, even though it didn't have any of those, um, those neighborhoods considered hazardous. So one of the things um, that some neighbors in Arlington uh, brought to our attention was a racial covenant uh, that, that uh, a neighbor found um, when doing research on his property. Um, this is from 1923, a racially restrictive covenant on his, the deed to his property. And it actually applies to a whole neighborhood. Um, I pulled out the relevant text, but effectively it says no sale or lease of any of said lots shall be made to colored people, nor any dwelling erected on any of said lots be sold to or occupied by colored people. This covenant applies to over 200 parcels uh, south of Lake Street, east of the Miniman Bikeway and west of Mass Ave, um, as well as both sides of Burnham Street on the south. Um, so I did like a few minutes of research on this and, um, and thanks to uh, local historian Richard Duffy, I found this article um, about, uh, about um, the Allen family, which, uh, which is the, um, were the owners of this land that got subdivided. Abbott Allen uh, initially came to Arlington or then West Cambridge uh, to, um, to take a manufacturing job. And then when he got married, he moved into, um, it, he took over his wife's, um, family's farm. And he also served as the town treasurer. This really struck me because one, it was sort of that ability to, to move from, um, from having a manufacturing job into being able to own property and um, and to make uh, income off of it, as well as to gain prominence in the community and have um, and have a have some power. Um, and then the, the the next generation expanded land holdings, and his grandson actually took um, the land uh, that we saw in the previous slide and subdivided it for residential development and family names were used for the streets. Um, Herbert Allen went on to build other large projects and his brother uh, moved the farming operation out to Concord 
to 168 acres. This really struck me as an example of being able to build generational wealth. And when you couple that with the racially restrictive covenants on that land, it kind of starts to build a picture and you start to build a picture in your mind. So that brought to mind the Boston Globe 2017 Spotlight series. And um, ideas around generational wealth as well as um, net worth of uh, of people of color, but specifically black Bostonians or people in metropolitan Boston who uh, are black and African-American. The median net worth of black Bostonians really is $8 as the headline says. So those were just a few kind of, again, patterns and statistics to get you thinking about what is the big picture, what is the house we live in that Leon shared, which was about maybe showed examples of suburbanization from other parts of the country and, um, and the historical trends that Katie talked about, um, bringing it back to the community. And some of the things that we hear over and over in this work, not just in Arlington, but in so many of our communities is we're full. What does it mean to um, we can't uh, have more people here. And again, I showed that Ellington actually used to have a lot more people than we do now. Um, we want to preserve the character of our town. How might those words sit with you if you're new to the community um, or if you are in the minority? Um, what does it mean to have local preference for, for new housing projects? Um, there is certainly a crisis of being, of people families wanting their next generations to be able to live close to where they are. But what does that choice mean in terms of gen, um, metropolitan mobility and other people who want to be able to get into the market? And, and sort of this idea, I didn't grow up in Massachusetts. I grew up in the Midwest in Iowa. And one of the things that was always really striking to me was this idea that you really have to be like, generations or or at least be born or have your childhood in a place to be really considered to be from uh, a city or town in Massachusetts. Um, that was true when I lived in Cambridge. It's true when I live now here in Melrose. And certainly I believe it's probably true for a lot of folks in Arlington. So what does it mean when people always feel like they have to justify um, that they're new? Uh, I didn't include the video, but um, I highly recommend the sort of four minutes in this 30 minute video, minutes 11 to 15 from Dr. Robin D'Angelo. She's, this is before she wrote her um, now bestseller book on white fragility, um, but this is a video called Deconstructing White Privilege with Do Dr. Rob Do Robin D'Angelo. And so I just pulled out a few quotes. Um, the most profound example of everyday racism is segregation. What do we mean when we say good or bad schools or neighborhoods? It's coded language. How are race and segregation, um, how do they shape us? She says, I've had to think very deeply on what it means to have grown up in a primarily white neighborhood, living life in segregation, and to not have one single person who loved, mentored, guided me to convey that there was any loss. I can live my whole life in segregation. In fact, if I follow the trajectory that my loving parents laid out for me in my good neighborhood and my good school and my good college and my good career in which I would ideally rise to the top, I could easily never have any consistent ongoing authentic relationships with people of color and not one person who guided me ever conveyed that there was loss. Just, let, just sit with that for a moment, that there is no inherent value in the perspective or experiences of people of color. If my parents, if my schools, if my curriculum, if my teachers, if my government saw value in those perspectives, I would be given those perspectives, but I wasn't. And that shapes my relationships. It shapes what I care about. It shapes what I see, what I don't see, who I build my life with and who I don't build my life with. I shared that because it sort of really strikes me a lot of times when we talk about race, we're talking about opportunity, um, an opportunity gap for um, 
the Black and Latinx population and for other um, groups that are disadvantaged in some way um, economically as well as with access and opportunity um, in other ways. But really, this to me conveyed the value for all of us in diversifying our communities. So where do we go from here? Um, I hope that you are able to observe some patterns and think about maybe how can town government help? Um, who is represented at town meeting in, in town governance and on town as well as um, maybe nonprofit boards and institutional boards and committees? Who are the decision makers in town and are they representative of the of issues around race, but also people with lived experiences um, around race. What can residents and other community members do? What can you do? What does it mean to belong to a community? Um, and what are we missing out on by living in a segregated community? Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Crystal and hopefully we'll have some time for some Q&A. That's exactly right, Manisha. That's where we're going to move this program on because we've gotten a lot of great discussion that's happening uh, in the chats. We do want to remind folks to be mindful of the ground rules because we want this to be a discussion where everyone can participate and feel like this is a safe space for that to happen. Um, but I re one of the few th themes that, one of the themes rather that came up a few times was uh, addressing this recent uh, study that came out with from the Boston Foundation and Suffolk University um, that found examples of discrimination of, of black people and folks with a, a Section 8 voucher or housing voucher. And, and that discrimination being found in cities like uh, in communities like Arlington. And so I know we were speaking with the panelists about this earlier. Um, and Catherine, you, you're familiar with this data. So I, I want to have you jump in here to talk a little bit about that and what it means to this discussion and how we can do better. Yeah, so first for folks who like weren't are familiar with the findings of this study, um, just to briefly give you guys background on that, what this study found, so it sent out essentially identical um, black prospective renters and white prospective renters to go out into the greater Boston area um, to try to find apartments. They contacted landlords, they contacted realtors, and the findings just are, I think, have sent shockwaves into the housing community. I think everyone knew that there was racism in greater Boston housing markets, but the magnitude of the effect is just unreal. Um, so black renters were over 30 percentage points less likely to be shown an apartment um, and to get a response relative to white renters. And that is just an incredible level of private market discrimination. Um, and so what I want to help folks on the call to do is to first sort of contextualize this with the you know, information dump you've just had from really great presentations from Nadisha and from Leon, um, and then to think about like what we can do here in Arlington to solve this. Um, and so what the presentations today have hopefully outlined for you is that there have been deliberate government actions at the federal level with things like redlining and at the local level with things like zoning um, to segregate communities. Uh, the private market has also really helped out in segregating communities and has been a really powerful contributor. And so discrimination by landlords and discrimination by realtors has been a really big part of the story as well. And so what that Boston Globe Suffolk University report really speaks to is um, sort of the private market role in all of this. And so again, when, when we look at that private market discrimination, I wouldn't look to a policy like zoning or something like that to solve this issue. I would look to something like fair housing law and figuring out ways that we can build legal cases against um, the folks who are engaging in discrimination, right? That's sort of one powerful tool that we could have at our disposal. And I would also look um, you know, in the less punitive direction at what we can do to educate realtors and landlords about their sort of the discriminatory outcomes of their behavior, right? I think a lot of realtors, most realtors and landlords, I hope, are out there with sort of the best of intentions and not looking to sort of engage in racist actions. And so trying to bring awareness to that kind of um, what sort of their behavior is and what the outcomes have been for black people seeking rental housing in Boston. And when, you know, one of the questions were, uh, when we're talking about defining affordable housing, Arlington has battled for a long time about misunderstandings around what affordable housing is 
and what that term means, especially as it me what it means in terms of compliance with 40B in Arlington, what that means about building up or building out. And so if one of you all can sort of answer, answer some of those concerns, because we're getting a lot of questions about that. Yeah, I, yeah. I, yeah, I would, I would speak to that's a larger challenge for a lot of a number of cities and towns. And, and, and I think as cities that are committed to centering racial equity in as part of the frame, I think the question of understanding what affordability is, um, does require you to use a lens that maybe redefines affordability. Um, you know, and, and so one example, for instance, with one city, um, as, as many know that affordability is usually based upon the uh, AMI, the area, um, area of median income. And so in one city, the area, and I, and I appreciate the data that was shared earlier by Manisha, the area median income in this city was very similar. It was over 100,000 uh, um, median income. And then when they started to disaggregate it by race, which is so important if you're centering racial equity, they started to realize, well, when you look at the median income for whites, it was about 80,000. For blacks, it was uh, for Hispanics, it was fifty-five thousand, and for thirty, um, and for blacks, it was thirty-five thousand. And so, when they looked at their policy in this city, they realized that affordability was defined at eighty percent of AMI. Well, if you look at eighty percent of AMI, eighty percent of a hundred thousand is eighty thousand. So you are acknowledging that if you have a challenge on, a, on from a data standpoint that shows racially that. It, Latinx communities and black communities um, earn much less than that on the median, then what are you going to do to be more intentional about policy that is um, coming up with a different strategy that's more intentional? And so in this case, the example the, that the city, by using a racial equity lens, created a policy that uh, then set policy where there needed to be X percentage of affordable housing for people that were in the 30 to 60 percent of AMI, 60 to 80 percent of AMI, as well as under 30 percent of AMI. So acknowledging there was more intentionality about the policy, so you're not reinforcing the inequities. Um, and so that's just a great example for me of why data matters, getting that data, and what it means to be targeted. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, that targeted universalism. How are you targeted in your process as you have universal goals of making it more affordable for everyone? Yeah, and Manisha, you worked in, in, in city planning and city spaces, and I think one of the questions we had here was talking about Arlington moving up, like having, you know, more than a couple of stories and the misgivings about changing, I guess, what the footprint of the community um, is. And so how do we address that where some folks may be concerned about changing, I guess, the landscape in inviting diversity and why that's important? Sure. Um, so there's a number of different studies. Um, and I know Katie pointed to her own work as well as um, segregated by design and, and um, the work that I did when I was both at the Massachusetts Housing Partnership, as well as the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, all pointed to the need for additional housing production in order for us to be able to tackle our affordable house or our, our housing crisis really across the region. We don't have enough vacancy to um, really have a robust economy, um, which whether we're talking about subsidized affordable housing or just really affordability in general, um, it's, it, it does come down to a supply and demand issue. It's not only a supply and demand issue. Um, I think a lot of also attention needs to be paid in terms of what's getting built and who it's getting built for. Um, I think it's just behooves us to think about you know, all the different elements that are required in a community. Do we want, um, we need more housing. And I think sometimes there is that idea of character of a community. I think just really asking ourselves, what is that, wh what's really gonna change if we, if we go up uh, in terms of density? Um, I think for the most part, there's not really a lot of other options. We're not a place where we can go out and out and out. But there's also there's advantages to staying dense because that means I think a lot of probably what people love about Arlington is their ability to um, have a relatively efficient commute um, in the days when we actually commute, the ability to walk to um, 
to, to places around town and, and enjoy the vibrancy of that community. Um, I think there's a lot of value in, in allowing more people um, to be able to do that, whether we're talking about climate change, whether we're talking about um, just, again, I, it's all interlinked. I think this is one of the things that I think we're all trying to reiterate is that it's, it's so many different systems at play and needing to tackle our housing challenges um, through housing production is one of the ways we can start tackling some of those systemic issues. my technical difficulty. Catherine, I would have you weigh in here too, because I know a lot of your work also talks about different types of housing. So it doesn't have to be high rise apartment buildings in suburbs. It can be different types of housing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think one of the really important things that I, I want folks to take away from some of the stuff that I presented is that we've made it not just really difficult to build big apartment buildings, we've made it really hard to build townhouses. Um, and so in a lot of communities like Arlington, those are gonna be the way that we increase the housing supply um, in a way that sort of fits what the community is able to support, right? And so um, I, I wanna stress that that's, these dynamics have really affected both of those types of projects. Um, and I think the second point that I just wanna flag that Manisha did a great job of highlighting as well, is I think a lot of times when people hear upzoning, they say, we have enough housing or the housing costs are already so high here. Why aren't we building enough affordable housing? And I wanna stress that there are sort of two separate problems going on in our housing markets right now in the greater Boston area. We don't have enough market rate housing. Every study of greater Boston has shown this, that we're not producing enough market rate housing and it's made already expensive housing, crazy expensive. And so we need to be building more market rate housing. Um, and jointly, we also need to be producing more um, affordable housing. I think the challenge there is when we're pressuring our local government they have a lot of levers that help us build market rate housing. They don't have as many levers that are going to help us build large scale affordable housing projects. They can help us get some affordable housing projects too, but federal and state cutbacks have made the construction of many, many units of affordable housing as in you know, publicly subsidized housing, really, really difficult at the local level. And so I just hope that people can think about when they're angry about there not being enough of a certain type of housing in their community, which is the right level of government that's sort of really responsible um, for that particular outcome. One of the other questions we had, and, and I want you all to sort of both break down what this question might mean and what it what what the answer would be is, what is the intersection between single family zoning and racism? Um, and so for folks who may not understand that, just sort of break down what that means. And I, I assume on its face, it has something to do with make creating zoning laws where you're only creating single family households, but but I'm not the expert you all are. Anybody can jump in. Yeah, I say I don't. Manisha, I don't know if you want to jump in, I'm happy to start and then have you, because um, you you talked about this issue as well. So I think another way to say single family zoning is that it bans apartment buildings, right? It makes apartment buildings illegal. Um, and I think when you frame the zoning that way, if you say it is now illegal to build anything more than one unit of housing in a particular place, its exclusionary intent becomes clearer. Um, when we say you can only build single family housing in a neighborhood, what that implicitly says and what the cities and towns that made that designation um, were saying is we only want people who can afford a single family house to live in this community. Um, and when we build multifamily housing in places, the housing stock becomes more affordable. This is something we've seen time and time again. And so um, that's sort of when we think about the exclusionary intent, both in terms of race and class, I think that's a helpful starting point. I don't know, Manisha, if you wanted to jump in with more. You're still muted. I know. I swear, you would think I like haven't been using Zoom for the last uh, four months, but um, so I was actually just looked up this um, really great article um, around, from uh, about Seattle zoning, and it's called like "This is How You Slow Walk Into a Housing Shortage," and talking about sort of over time how the zoning has become more and more restrictive um, to the point where it's become so exclusionary. So. While you were talking, I was trying to figure out how to post that into the Q and A. Um, but it's a, it's, it's just an illustration of we've gotten so used to these ideas of these like 
neighborhoods where where housing types are separated and um, and we really can have diversity of housing within neighborhoods uh, in a way that we haven't seen in many in many of our lifetimes but that used to exist more commonly I also I also want to to ask because I think this is a this question really struck me when we got and we are taking questions from the community um, uh, someone wrote to us, a friend who lives in a nearby town and is a person of color has been searching for a new place to live and, and told me, the, the, the person who's asking the question, that Arlington is not on her list because she doesn't feel comfortable walking down the street here. And that makes this, this uh, person very sad. What steps should the town be actively ta be taking to make Arlington more welcoming to folks of color, especially when we're talking about this housing conversation and looking at housing and, of course, the Boston Foundation and Suffolk University study that shows that these barriers of discrimination exist and folks just trying to look for an apartment or look for a house? Leon, why don't you jump in here? Yeah, sorry, I was trying to find my mute button. Um, it's a great question. I would love to say that there is an easy answer to how do you build trust. Um, I do think if there is a space where um, there is folks do not feel welcome, um, there is a, a question of why. Why, why is it that they do not feel welcome? Um, and as a city, um, as a town, um, you know, is there a space to, I think, um, to acknowledge the spaces where you have not made it welcoming before? If you're willing to kind of create the space to say, look, we want to be a space, uh, a town that's more welcoming, um, you know, then there's, I think, part of the history and narrative that we've been laying out that a lot of the history here um, is that there was an intentionality of this not being a town that was welcoming to people of color. Um, um, historically, when you look at redlining and racial covenants, and as there has been, I think as Manisha laid out, the, the data that continues to show policies that continue to reinforce that. Um, so there is a pattern, right? And I think part of the work that the town, and I know and um, us working with, um, with uh, the city and the, um, on this is is creating more spaces for these very difficult conversations. Um, and how are you acknowledging that there is more work to be done um, that allows for people to see by your actions that you also are acknowledging your history, but also committing to structural change. And I think both um, both need to happen if people are going to really, um, you know, be willing to see that this is going beyond just checking the box to say we want to talk about it, but we really are committed to making some structural changes. So I don't have a, a, I've been trying to think about how to answer this question. And like, I think most of us who are people of color or also women, you know, I think there's like a mental calculus that, that you quickly do to figure out whether this is a safe space. And I think and so I've been trying to think about how to articulate what, like what, what is it that when I walk down a street or in, enter a new town, what is it that makes me feel like, yeah, I feel comfortable here and, and no, I don't, or I want to kind of, um, some of that's based on our own maybe stereotypes at times, but a lot of times it's actually things that are just these subtle cues, right? Um, I think I know I so I used to live in Baltimore um, and it was racially diverse, but there weren't as many people like me there. And I remember looking into the data and finding that it was actually the place with the, the fewest percentage wise Asian people of any place I'd lived and sort of realizing that sometimes you just quickly see that when you're walking around. Um, so some of it is, you know, it'll become more welcoming as it becomes more diverse. But, um, but also thinking about like, what are signage? What are, um, how is the town inviting people into events and um, just subtle language cues that we use um, to make things about sort of not us and them. I think that's something in Melrose I think about a lot is, is that it's not, it's not how, what can we do to make it more welcoming for you? But it's like, 
how can we be a more welcoming community and how are we all part of um, a welcoming community together, if that makes sense. One of the um, other questions that we're hearing is um, this conversation about towns investing more in affordable housing and divesting from other parts of government. What do you see in your research and, and whether that be anecdotal or, or some of the studies that have been conducted is the best way to sort of uh, uh, address this issue? And what I mean by that is, is it grants that the town gives out? Is it incentives on the local level? Is it incentives on the state level? Is it uh, changes in zoning? Um, what's the best way to sort of get at this issue? So I guess I, I love a multi-pronged approach. Like I think this is not a problem that any level of government can solve by itself. Um, and so I absolutely, you know, I, I support the idea of local governments putting more of their resources into affordable housing, but local governments, especially in the era of COVID-19 are incredibly cash strapped. Um, and frankly, right now, I think the best we can hope from local governments nationally is that they're able to institute some kind of eviction protections when they're able to, I think, rent relief funds for a lot of, of communities even are just gonna be really hard for them to come up with on any meaningful scale. And the ones that we are seeing have, you know, lotteries that are many, many times the size of um, sort of the, the number, the dollar amounts they can actually provide. So when I look at the local government, I see them as the most effective thing they can do is make their land use accommodating of more housing and welcoming of affordable housing, especially. And I really see it as critical that the state and federal level in particular provide massive cash infusions, especially in this moment right now where renters in particular are just really, really hurting. Um, and so, yeah, I think that, that sort of thinking about the different levels of government together is really important. The only thing I'd add to that is I think there's a lot of local um, tools that exist, like we have Community Preservation Act, there's um, grant funding um, that, you know, Katie mentioned, there's a lot of tools that, that don't, they aren't, you know, taking resources away from local government, which is kind of what I heard in that question. It's not, it's not sort of this either or proposition. I think a lot of times it is investing in um, our town staff sometimes, um, because they're the ones who need to uh, apply for grants and need the support from the community to be able to get the resources to do all the things, which include, uh, including affordable housing. Yeah, the, the, I think the other piece for me that I think we've named at the beginning, but and what make sure it's important not to get lost here is the importance of centering the voices of the black indigenous and people of color in the space. And so you're asking a question that I think uh, if you really are committed to centering racial equity, their voices and understanding kind of what they're looking for, what they need, um, what kind of results are you trying to set for the, for affordability? I feel like that, that needs to be front and center, right? And, and, and as you're driving um, the strategy. So I don't want that to get lost because we come with frames, but we don't come with all the answers. And, and there's not one city or town that has figured all of this out, right? And I think, um, but we do know how important it is to center voices in, in, in the work we do. Excellent, and Leon, you actually just teed us up because as we, we were just sort of um, wrapping up our conversation, but I want to make sure that folks know that in our next series, we're going to be elevating suppressed voices here in Arlington. And that's going to be taking place on uh, Tuesday, July uh, 21st at 7 p.m. We're calling on um, the community members of color to submit videos of their experiences in town um, because we really want to elevate those voices because we think that that's really important. Um, so if you reside, if you attend school, if you work or have a business in town and are a person of color, this is really an opportunity to have your voice uh, highlighted. And if you don't want to show yourself on video, you can also submit a written um, account for us as well. And that can be anonymous. Um, you can, we're gonna, we have information up on the slide. We're gonna be posting stuff on the town's website, on the, uh, the human rights website as well. And you can um, upload it to a Dropbox, use your phone, get it horizontal, not vertical. Have a young person help you if you need to. <laughs> and, and, um, and you can also submit any questions to 
AHRC events at gmail.com. Again, all of that information we're going to be posting on the town's website and on our social media on the human rights. Um, but I want to give all of our panelists a moment to uh, wrap up and any ending thoughts that you want to leave us uh, with as we as we move forward here. And I'll start with you, Manisha, just because that's the way it's lined up in my Zoom. <laughs> Um, well, I just want to thank uh, the town of Arlington for this opportunity and, and Crystal, Katie and Leon, it was really great to spend this evening with you and all of the viewers. Um, I think this is, this is a tough topic. Uh, we're talking about systems change, but we're also talking about sort of examining our own um, preferences and, and actions and how those might affect um, how we may be the change we want to see in the world. Um, I encourage folks to keep looking at, at the patterns and keep asking those questions and do them actively while you're walking about in your community or interacting with your neighbors. Um, so again, I was really excited to be here tonight and um, excited to continue the conversation as well. Catherine, you're up. All right. Um, so thanks to everyone. Um, I, Manisha, Leon, your remarks were just so interesting and I learned a lot um, from you guys. And thanks to my wonderful neighbors in the town of Arlington um, for your awesome questions. And I really look forward to continuing this conversation. I think the last thing that I just wanna leave folks with is to really build on this important point that Leon raised about whose voices are in the room when we're talking about housing politics. We know that black people, Latinx people, immigrants, and renters are deeply underrepresented in forums about housing politics. Let's get their voices in the room because that's how we're going to get the best policies that meet the needs of those individuals. Yeah, and also just want to express my my thanks to, to you, Crystal, for moderating, to the town for hosting, and to my panelists for um, what I think was a really good start to uh, a needed conversation. Um, really encouraged to, to see the number of folks that were joining us this evening for the discussion. Um, and acknowledging that as we're in this space of, you know, um, kind of quarantine and sheltering in place, that we really encourage ourselves to kind of push our own understanding of some of these issues and really want to encourage there are a lot of good reads. You've heard some of the, some of the good books that were mentioned earlier. There are some good documentaries that I showed one as well that what are you doing to kind of expand your understanding of, of why the change is needed um, as we're talking about the kinds of solutions that will transform how we make decisions in government. And we have to be willing to disrupt that. And if not, we'll find ourselves coming back just uh, from uh, promoting solutions that we've tried already before. So I do really hope and encourage that folks are willing to push themselves to be uncomfortable, uh, continue to have these conversations and we're excited to be a part of it as as you're doing that. So thank you so much. And thank you all for your time and, and those detailed presentations because that work is so important. And we had a lot of folks in community, in community engaged in submitting questions and asking us questions in the Q and A. Um, again, we want to say that our next series is about elevating suppressed voices and that information will be posted uh, on the Human Rights Commission pages and the ones here in town. And that's how we forward our next conversation. You can submit questions around that as well. We also wanna make sure that we, uh, you all at home see the resources that are available. This will be posted uh, on, ta on town as well and as on our human rights um, pages as well. These are resources when we're talking about housing. Um, these are organizations that really dig down on some of these issues and, and that's so important because that and a lot of the work as well that our panelists are doing, they work in conjunction with these groups. We wanna thank again our panelists for tonight all of you for attending and viewing this conversation and for submitting questions and feedback. We're, we have so many questions that come in, but we hope we hit, we hit all of the ones that, that are important to you. And we wanna remind you that all of our conversations, again, were recorded and will be posted and will be broadcasted by ACMI. So for now, we're gonna say good night, but the conversation continues. So thank you so much. <laughs>